usually when we talk about cosmopolitan communities, either the past or the present, we tend to think of places that are very well communicated, like ports of trade, uh, commercial hubs, uh, coastal areas are usually very cosmopolitan. But I would like to talk about a place that is, or an area that is very different. It's actually a marginal, it's a peripheral area. It's the borderland between Sudan and Ethiopia. And this is not, properly speaking, a cosmopolitan place, but it is a place where you can see a confluence of ideas, of uh, material cultures, of traditions, and people in this very remote and uncommunicated area uh, do absorb uh, traditions in different ways. So I would like to talk a little bit about how this marginal area could be conceived as uh, cosmopolitan, at least in some periods of, of its history. And I would like to explain why at some point this area was more cosmopolitan and at some other points it was more secluded and rejected innovations coming from elsewhere. Uh, the borderland between Sudan and Ethiopia is a very old uh, buffer zone between states, at least from the uh, third millennium BC onwards. This has been uh, a region that lies between two very strong state, state traditions, those of Sudan and those of Ethiopia. And I've been working there for almost uh, 20 years now. Uh, I've done basically ethnoarchaeological work for like 10 years, and during the last five years, I've been doing more archaeological work focusing on the uh, Kwara region, which is located there in Metema and Kwara, which is in north uh, western Ethiopia. Um, this is an area of uh, geographical contrast and also of cultural contrast. So you have the, uh, the highlands of Ethiopia, the limit of the highlands of Ethiopia, this very dramatic escarpment. And then you have the lowlands that go towards Sudan. Uh, this, uh, this drastic divide is, as I was saying, geographical, but it is also cultural. The cultures of the highlands and the cultures of the lowlands are extremely different. But this is neither Sudan nor Ethiopia. It's a different thing. It's, it, we cannot see it just as a borderland, where things uh, more or less resemble those in the highlands or those in the lowlands. It's actually uh, something quite unique. So we have been focusing mostly during the last three years on the Galego River, uh, which is one of the main natural routes leading from Sudan to Ethiopia. It's a seasonal river, like many other rivers in this area of the Horn. And we have been able to document the settlement of this region between the mid first millennium AD and the uh, 20th, 21st century. Uh, the area was basically depopulated before the late, mid-late first millennium AD. Before that, it was only visited seasonally by hunter-gatherers that were using Neolithic technology as late as the late uh, first millennium AD. And then we see uh, transhuman pastoralists arriving to this area uh, during uh, what would be called in Sudan the post meroitic or the early Christian period. And so these people uh, can probably uh, and occupy the, uh, the uh, riverbanks of the Gelegu uh, for, uh, during the, uh, the winter season in Ethiopia, when there is still some green pasture here. Um, these are very small communities of just a few families. The sites are really, really small, just a few uh, thousand square meters, 3,000, 2,000 square meters. And the, uh, the material culture is, is very limited. They only have a few types of pots, which make sense with uh, a mobile community. And some of these pots are strongly related to the kind of pottery that you find in Sudan in this period. Now, the element that is particularly interesting is the spindle wool, because these artifacts are exactly the same as those that we find in Sudan for this period. Um, so they are the sign that, that you can see along the Blue Nile in Sudan. Uh, the typology is extremely similar. The other things, they are similar, but they are not exactly the same, whereas with the spindle wall, the things that they are exactly the same. And uh, my interpretation is that these people, they were coming from the periphery of the uh, Sudanese states of the period, like the probably, the probably kingdom of, of Senar in the early Middle Ages or the kingdom of Soba, they were coming from the periphery of these kingdoms. They were absorbing some of the cultural traditions from these areas. 
And one of the elements that was more, more important from a symbolic point of view was this spiller wall because it created a sort of common identity between this very remote area and the core of the uh, Sudanese states at the time. Now from the uh, 13th century onwards, the situation changes dramatically. These transhuman communities disappear and we no longer have these agropastors that are moving through the landscape. We have people that uh, climb the uh, hills and the mountains these uh, volcanic hills that uh, dot the, uh, the plains of Kuala and Metema, and they establish communities up there. The material culture changes quite a lot, and these elements that link these people with the, uh, with, uh, the Sudan uh, virtually disappear. Um, at the, uh, during the uh, 14th century, many of these hilltop sites disappear, and people seem to be concentrated in just one of these sites, which is Jebel Mahadir, which is occupied between the 15th and the uh, 16th centuries. And it's a very large site with, um, we have documented over 300 structures, domestic structures and granaries. So there was probably a population of over 1,000 people. And you have to remember that only uh, three or four centuries before, we were talking about very small agro-pastoralist communities of just 20 or 25 people. So this is a completely uh, revolution for this place. And it was probably motivated by uh, political changes in the Sudan. So this is a time when the kingdom, the Christian kingdom of Soda, enters um, a crisis. Uh, we don't know much about uh, what is going on in the kingdom of Soda, in the, uh, the kingdom of Alodia. But it seems that from the 13th century onwards, it, it declines. And the kingdom probably uh, transfers uh, to the south. And it's at that time when we have more kingdoms, small kingdoms or chiefdoms emerging closer to the actual boundary with Ethiopia. And these small kingdoms were probably engaging in slave uh, raiding in the, uh, in the borderland near Ethiopia, near the Ethiopian escarpment. And this is the reason why these people, in the first place, they go to the hilltops. And then they end up concentrating in this huge site, uh, which is naturally and artificially defended, because for the first time we document uh, something resembling a rampart. Uh, we excavated some of the compounds. The architecture uh, of the site is very well preserved because it's not sedimented, everything is on the surface. We excavated several of the, uh, of the huts and got lots of uh, radiocarbon dates. And it's interesting to see the people, the, the process of impoverishment of the material culture of these places. So the connections with the Sudan are gradually lost and the material culture becomes coarser and coarser. So it seems that uh, people invest less in producing things. Uh, artifacts are less careful. But still there are some connections with the Sudan. And these connections are very interesting because uh, they have to do with eating habits. So we have these uh, griddles, these baking uh, vessels, uh, flat uh, vases where, where, they are, where they are probably preparing uh, something resembling the Kisra in Sudan, this uh, sort of bread, which is something that is still being done in the area. So it is through, through these eating habits that they keep a contact with the Sudan. During all this time, during all these centuries, despite that these people are really, really close to the highlands, they are much closer to the Ethiopian highlands than they are to the core of the Sudanese states. They have no contact at all with Ethiopia. We have only one artifact that was imported from Ethiopia at the very end of this period in the late 16th century, which is a piece of Ethiopian pottery, which obviously comes from the highland. And I will explain the reason for this later. But then, uh, during the late 17th century, this place becomes more connected again, uh, only during a short period, between the late 17th century and the mid 19th century. So it seems that from the late 16th century onward, place, the, the, this area becomes depopulated again, and we believe that this is because of slave raids, because this large site I was telling you about, this Jebel Mahadid, was completely destroyed, all the, all the houses are burnt, there are lots of artifacts on the surface, so it seems that people simply fled. And the place is abandoned until the late 17th century, when we have an influx of new refugees coming to Ethiopia, escaping in this case from the, content, from the conquest of the periphery of the French Sultanate that had been established in central Sudan near Khartoum, uh, near Sennaf in the, uh, in the uh, early 16th century. 
So we have an explosion of villages at this time. It, it seems that the area is occupied very fast and very densely in a record time. So uh, we, had, we only had one or two sites by the late 16th century, this uh, huge site, this huge refuge in another site. And then 100 years later, we have like 25 sites in the same region. The, uh, the, the kind of sites, uh, apparently they, they, the, the villages were very similar to the uh, present uh, settlements that you find in the area, uh, which are indigenous communities of uh, Nilo-Saharan, uh, speaking Nilo-Saharan languages. But now the interesting thing is how these people start incorporating things from all over the world. We have found Chinese uh, porcelain from the 18th century, we have Indian uh, beads, we have European glass beads, uh, we have uh, Chinese uh, decorated, uh, I mean, painted porcelain, and we have things coming from other places, from the Islamic Sudanese tradition, like this ablution jar. We have incense burners identical to those that you can find in Nubia or in Sanaa, and we have pipes, uh, smoking pipes, which of course are evidence of the uh, introduction of, of traditions that are global that come uh, in this case from the United States. And this cosmopolitan world uh, disappeared during the uh, mid 19th century due to the, token, the Egyptian invasion and conquest of the Sudan, which ended up with the, uh, basically the extermination of these people in the borderlands. So the sites again become deserted during the mid 19th century and there is no occupation until the mid 20th century again, so it's like a sort of cyclical history of slavery and recovery from slavery. So to conclude, despite the uh, very marginal character of this region, the uh, Sudanese Ethiopian borderland was always connected to the neighboring uh, state traditions, at least from the uh, late first millennium AD. And these connections were always stronger with, uh, with the Sudan, and for three reasons, some of them are obvious, more obvious than others. The communication is easier with the Sudan through these rivers, like the Kalego River, the Blue Nile, the Dinda River, and so on. Uh, borderland peoples were originally Sudanese. They were coming from the actual territory of the Republic of Sudan. And they maintained relations with their homelands. And the, their homeland, Sudan, acted as a sort of uh, symbolic reservoir, as has been described for the case of West Africa. So they were... Uh, using uh, their homeland as a sort of uh, area of cultural resources that where they could be drawing from time to time. But the main reason, in my opinion, is that Ethiopia saw the borderland always, from at least from the late first millennium AD, as a zone of predation. So it was basically a place where they were taking slaves, uh, they were looting the villages, and so on. And they really didn't consider these people like real human beings. They would consider them like they would call Shanga, which is a derogative term to refer to all black people living in the lowlands. So um, connections are more intense when cosmopolitan cultures develop at the core of the state. And this is why during the Funch period, during the period of the Funch Sultanate in Sudan between the 16th century and the early 19th century, uh, the uh, connections between the periphery and the Sudan were stronger because basically the Funch state was a multicultural state which had lots of connections with other regions in the world, but also the, the very composition of the state was multicultural, multi-ethnic. So it was open to other kinds of traditions. And finally, the rejection of alien artifacts is stronger when the borderland is, of course, perceived as basically a predation zone. Uh, and this happened during the late Middle Ages and again during the 19th century. Thank you. Thank you.